But good morning, everybody. We want to invite you to stand, welcome you to sing along. We're going to worship Jesus together. Let's put our hands together. This is.
So that's a new song for us, um, but I wanted to sing the chorus together one more time. But before we do, I just wanted to remind you just of the truth of the scriptures, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's not the strength of the Lord is our strength, it's not our strength is our strength, but it's his joy. And so it's a gift that's given to us. It's a gift that is given despite our circumstances. It's, it goes beyond, it goes deeper than happiness and surface level, but it's a, it's a deeply rooted joy that can only come from Jesus. And it's something that you can experience right now. And so I just encourage you, make this prayer with me this morning. Just say, God, would you just pour out your joy on my life? Would you just remind me in the midst of my circumstance, in the midst of my challenge, that you are with me and that your joy is my strength and that you'd just be filled with that strength today. So let's sing that together, sing the joy. The joy of the Lord, joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, joy of the Lord is my strength. And oh my soul, bless his name, let all that is within me say, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's sing that again, the joy. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let it rise this morning. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And oh my soul, bless his name, let all that is within me say, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you to the Park Church. We're so glad that you chose to join this morning. I wanted to start off just by saying Happy Mother's Day um, to all the mother mothers that are with us. And we just want to let you guys know just how much you are loved and we just want to honor you and yeah where would we be without our mothers and I know um, yeah I hope today that you are able to experience just the the love that we have for you and I'm also aware that it's a day that can be hard for people for a myriad of different reasons and I just want to encourage you that God sees you he knows your circumstance he knows what's going on in your heart any weight or grief maybe that you're feeling with your mother situation, just know that God sees you today, and he wants to meet with you. And just as we sang, you know that he's more than enough for us. And sometimes we zoom in so much on our problems that we just lose track of the big picture, but let's all remind ourselves today that God, when he gives his presence, it's enough for us. It's enough for our circumstance, and we can, yeah, we can just rest in that this morning. So, I just encourage you to sing along, I encourage you to worship, and yeah, let's sing together. Let's put our hands together. Sing I raise.
goodness. Lord, sometimes we may not understand all of your ways. Lord, and, and you tell us not to lean on our understand, our own understanding sometimes. But Lord, we're called to trust you as someone who is higher and wiser and who is sovereign. So Lord, when we're going through the fire, or we're going through the storms of life, and, and we're experiencing things we don't understand, Lord, we will just stand firm in the fact that you're good, and you never change, and you're faithful. And because of that, we can trust you. So thank you, God, for being a good and holy and loving and trustworthy God. And we put our lives in your palm, put our lives uh, just in your will and say, let your will be done in Jesus' name because you're good and we love you so much. And Lord, um, I just want to thank you today for uh, all your good things, all your blessings, Lord. Um, the families that you've given us, the mothers you've given us, uh, the church that you've given us, and of course, uh, life in Christ. Uh, thank you for your grace. And I just felt like I had to share this today. Um, we should be thanking for the things that we take for granted. God's subtle but monumental gifts in our life. So Lord, we thank you for your providence. And Lord, we thank you for the air we breathe and the country we live in and the community and the church that you've given us, Lord. Don't, not, don't ever let us forget that. Lord, thank you for that because all good things come from you. And Lord, I pray today for a number of people in our church. I, I think of Walter Cooney, who lost his son this last week um, to cancer. Lord, that you would comfort Walter and his extended family. Just surround, them, surround him and his family with your love and your peace and give him the strength. Allow him to experience joy in the midst of grief. Um, so I just pray for Walter. And Lord, I pray for Jane Riken's daughter, Sherry, who's... Uh, going through an illness, Lord, that you would touch her with your healing hand, Lord, that you would sustain her, Lord, that you give wisdom to the doctors and that the treatment and all that sort of stuff would work the way it's supposed to, but be with Sherry right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for Dave Johnson as I visited him last week and he's getting over pneumonia and a flu and, and all that sort of stuff, Lord, I just pray that you would heal his body, that you would restore him, Lord, and that you would send friends to go visit him so he can have fellowship, which is just something that... Um, I think he would really appreciate friendship and fellowship, just those awesome conversations. Again, gifts from you, Lord, so thank you. And I just felt like uh, I would pray today that for all of the saints, everybody in here would be equipped to do what, Lord, you're calling them to do. They would have the wisdom and the strength and the confidence that's found in you that they would receive that so they could live out their God-given plan. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, please draw your attention to the big screen. We have a few announcements. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Park Church this morning. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so glad that you're here. And if you're a guest with us this morning, please feel free to text the word welcome to 587-600-1905. This is the best next step for you to get to know us as a church family. As well, we appreciate and we wanna to get to know you. So there's another person on the other end of that line willing to answer any other questions you may have. As well, if you're here with us this morning, please feel free to head out into the foyer to the connection table so you can receive a little gift from us just for saying thanks for being here. As well, if you're here and you call the Park Church your home and you would like to give this morning, please feel free to give online in the three main ways. The first one is through our online app, Tithely. You can download it from the App Store, you can get set up through the Park Church and you can give that way. The second way is that you can give through the envelopes in front of you and you can fill those out and drop those off in the boxes as you leave the sanctuary. And thirdly, you can always go to the Welcome Center in the foyer if you have any questions and want to give that way as well. We want to put out a save the date for all the youth in grades 7 to 12. On June 21st to 22nd, we're having an in-house retreat here in the Park Church ready for you. 
So registration will be coming out soon, but we want you to save the date, mark the calendar, and have you be ready for that amazing weekend. Graduation season is coming up quickly or has already arrived. And we, I specifically, want to know what's going on and what you've graduated from. So whether you're a grade 12 grad or graduate from a post-secondary certificate or degree or even farther, please come into contact with me, whether through calling in at the church, you can email me or you can just approach me as well. We as a church want to celebrate your graduation and want to send you off into the next season of life. There is so much going on here at the Park Church. So I wanna encourage you, please go to our website for any other information or any other questions you may have or registrations. You can go there, or if you're here with us in person, please feel free to go out into the Welcome Center in the foyer for more info as well. As always, we wanna thank you so much for being here this morning and enjoy the rest of the service. Park Church. pretty sad coming up with all this energy park church there you go now maybe you're a little bit tired because you got up early this morning and you wanted to bring your mom your spouse breakfast in bed so it's just a little bit unusual that you're this tired because you just had such a full morning already anybody get breakfast in bed this morning anybody still oh Whew, the 9 o'clock, the early service had you guys beat. Not only did they get up early, but they also brought the mom's breakfast in bed. Just saying. Um, it, we are thankful uh, for Mother's Day today, recognizing and, and honoring moms. And, uh, and I figured that, you know, the best way to do that, what, how do you, like, honor somebody to the, to the highest degree? And uh, what you do is you give them a standing ovation. Right, can we do that? You, moms, you stay seated. We want to give you a standing ovation. Okay, everybody else? <laughs> like you mean it, like you mean it, like you mean it. <laughs> Woo! Super. And, uh, and moms, on the way out of the uh, service today, we have a little gift for you. And uh, that's just our, our small way of, as a family, just uh, recognizing you and honoring you. Uh, now, at the end of the month, I just wanted to point out, we do have our prayer summit happening on the last uh, Sunday of May. It's our last one before our summer break, and then we'll kick back up in the fall. So um, 6 p.m., and uh, it's one hour of just prayer, seeking God together, and uh, child care is provided because we want, we want you to be there and bring your whole family and just uh, be, it's good to come together in God's house. Uh, well, let's just jump into the word. Anybody excited for the word today? We are in. There you go. We're in week six already of our series, Letter to the Church at Ephesus. And uh, it's going to be great because actually the, this section, it's going to be a little bit more than a double portion because we're going to take a few weeks um, from this point forward um, looking at the character, nature, and behavior of a person who is in Christ. Being in Christ was, is a big theme of the book of Ephesians. We've talked about it regularly. But we're going to look at matters of, of practice and reveal how this theology that we've been talking about is meant to be put into place, meant to be practically lived out. We have to understand what the implications of that are. And it's really taken Paul this far in this letter. We're, we're in chapter 4 today. But it's taken him this far in the letter to establish this framework. We, we started in week 1 and we said he's, he's building a framework, right? Uh, he was preaching to the church, so we know their foundation is Christ. But he started to build a framework uh, for them. What is the, what is the inhabitants of this house look like? What is the, what is the fine detail? What is the, the color? What is the, the substance? And so he started with the supremacy and sovereignty of God. That was over overall. The supremacy and sovereignty of God. And you can cue that. There we go. We're trying something new this morning. I needed you to see this visual as kind of God gave it to me. So supremacy and sovereignty of God. All that he is. That was the, the main point in, in chapter 1. And he talks about then about all things being brought under Christ. Right? They are brought to completion under Christ's authority. 
So you have sovereignty of God, then you have all things being brought into Christ. Then he talks about, remember who you were. Remember who you were. Not just who you were, but remember where you were. You were, you were far off, you were foreigners, you were removed, you, you weren't part of the, the covenant, all those things. Remember who you were. And, and then he talks about, remember now then, not who you were, but where you are now. Remember how Christ has, has redeemed you, has filled you. He's brought you together. We're, we're heirs of the same family, the same promise. It's Jews and Gentiles come together to form one new unity. And then all of that, all of these pieces, how is that being held together? Well, it's all being held together in Christ. All these pieces, this unique, the sovereignty of God, the supremacy of Jesus, his authority over all things, who you were, who you are now, all of that complicatedness held together in Christ. He's the glue. He's, he's holding it all together. He's holding all of this, this tension. You can see how it becomes a frame. And so inside of that, he's holding all of the tension, the tension of God's ultimate holiness and our unworthiness. Talking, he's holding the tension of your past and your present. He's holding the tension of your character and your calling. He, he's holding the tension of your weakness and yet your giftedness. He's holding together the differences, our obtuseness, our, our uniqueness, and yet our fitted togetherness, our perfect formness in all things. He's holding together our foreignerness, you know, our outsiderness, and then our citizenship in Christ. He's holding all these things perfectly within the tension of being in Christ. Dr. David Jeremiah gives this illustration of this kind of unity in an orchestra the conductor will have one musician play a note so that the other musicians can tune their instruments to it. By focusing on one note and adjusting their instruments accordingly, all the musicians can be sure they're playing in the same key. And in the same way, by focusing our lives on Christ instead of ourselves, we can be sure that we're all playing in concert with one another. When our lives are all tuned to Christ, we can be assured that we will be in tune one with another. And so really this is, the, this is coming to the application section of our study. You know, at the end of every good study, there's like, here's your application question. This is what you need to do. And so we're, we're looking at that. N.T. Wright, the great theologian, calls this section of the book of Ephesians the basic manual for living the Christian life. And he says we need to go back to it often. We need, we need to go back to it often, moving from theory and thought and ideology into practicality, making it practical. So are you ready for it? Ephesians 4 and 1. Therefore, I urge you. Therefore. Therefore, it goes all the way back to his initial remarks and his prayer of blessing in Ephesians 1 and 1. Therefore, I urge you as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul, the, the prisoner of the Lord, we said he'd probably already been in prison three to four years by this point. He was... A bond servant, he was a willing prisoner. His incarceration was for the glory of the church. And he says at this point, I urge you walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Everything I've said up to this point, everything that I've shown you and, and portrayed to you about the incredible work that God has done, now what is your response to that? Live worthy. Live worthy. There's, there's implications to this incredible new life that Christ has given you. Right? If anybody is in Christ, they are a new creation. And there's a responsibility now for those that are a new creation. And that is to live worthy. Live according to the weight. That's what that word is. It comes from a root word meaning weight. Live according to the weightiness of this. Walk proportionately to the value Value for value. Consider what Christ has done and now walk proportionately to the value to which he has achieved for us. Philippians 2 and 1, Paul is saying the same. He says, therefore, if any encouragement from being united with Christ. Anybody ever been encouraged by being united with Christ? One of us, okay. If, uh, if any comfort from his love. Anybody been comforted by Christ? It's five, six, seven more of us. Okay, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love being one in spirit and one in mind right he's saying walk accordingly think about christ 
Think of all that he's done. Think of what he's doing. You know, he closed out Ephesians 3 and 20. To God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine through you to the glory of God and Christ. Think of how immeasurably more he's working through you and then live out of that revelation. Live out of that. Be radiant. Be holy. Be united. Be glorious. You're the church. Now live out of that. He explains the same to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, saying, therefore, I urge you. You know, Paul, Paul was writing this letter and he had the Ephesians in his mind. He had prayed for them often. He said many times, I pray even on my knees for you. It, it was very common in Jewish culture. You prayed standing up. You see it when you go to Jerusalem, the wailing while they're praying standing up. He says, for you, I pause and I get on my knees before God and I pray. And in this moment, he's saying, I urge you, brothers and sisters. In view of God's mercy, remembering God's mercy, taking into consideration God's mercy, holding tightly to God's mercy from that, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. The New King James Version says it's your reasonable service. Or other translations, it's your reasonable act of worship. Church, it is reasonable in view of all that Christ has done that we live our lives and walk worthy. We have to walk worthy. A worthy life is one that is laid down before Christ. A worthy life is one who gives up all that we are and all that we have to lay it down on the altar of God. To be fully consumed or fully exhausted, right? Every, every uh, sacrifice that was put on the altar that was fully consumed and burned up. The offerings that were poured out to God. Fully poured out in order that there be a fragrant aroma of worship to God. That's what a worthy life is. To completely lay that all out before him. That God might be praised and worshipped. How, how is our life going to accomplish that? What is that going to look like? Well, that's the rest of the beginning of chapter 4. Verse 2, he says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God who is Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. You know, we're going to come back to those uh, descriptive words in, in verse 2, you know, the gentleness, humility. But you have to understand, in light of the culture they were in, this Greek culture, this Grecian culture, they actually elevated self. So for them to talk about humility and talk about meekness and gentleness and that that those were were despised postures and this is how he's telling us to live in this counter-cultural way again paul brings up the theme of unity being united is part of the worthiness of the call unity of the spirit unity of the spirit through the bond of peace through the holy spirit that by which all of this flows 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, For we are all baptized by one Spirit, as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, free or slave. We were all given one Spirit to drink. And so Paul, again, he's asserting unity or oneness or togetherness is a huge part of walking out a calling worthy of the sacrifice which Christ has made on your behalf. Unity or walking together, and he, he emphasizes it by a sevenfold rep repetition of the word one seven times he says he says one body one spirit one hope one lord one faith one baptism one god oneness be one jesus died so that we could be one jesus in john 17 which is his priestly prayer he prays that we would be one john 17 and 20 jesus is praying says my prayer is not for them alone Meaning, not just for those that were hearing, not just for the, the disciples and the followers of that day, but he says, but for all those who will believe in me through their message. My prayer is that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. The glorious mystery of that 
Jesus being fully God in the Father, together, completely one, united, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. That the dynamic of that, unfathomable to us at this moment, Jesus is praying, I pray that you experience the same oneness that I experience with the Father. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So, walking worthily, Walking in the weightiness, living accordingly, living consciously to what Christ has done is going to show people and cause them to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Church, the Bible tells us that how will they know that you are my disciple? By your love one for another. We can't escape the command for the church to have unity. Is little light on the on the unity and the amen. We have to be united. We're united in love. He 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 hammers this home. This is why we're walking through Ephesians slowly and strategically because he's pulling all of these threads along. This is the reason. He's already established his argument. Look at all God has done. So walk worthily. It's your reasonable act of worship to live according to it. He's done so much. So how, how are people going to understand who Jesus is? It's through the picture of the church. And so the church then, that's our testimony, how we behave, what we act like. That's the testimony of who Jesus is. And so the testimony about Jesus can't be watered down. It can't be diluted. It can't be diverted. There ought to be no division, separation, right? We said that. We talked about two visions. They can't have any of that in order that the testimony be true. And for the Ephesian church... We reference that Ephesus was on a trade route. It was part of a major trade route. And so there are many roads going through and from Ephesus. So think of Ephesus as the hub to which the gospel message was going to be spread out. It was going to be like the epicenter for the dissemination of the good news. And so they had this obligation to hold true to the teachings of Jesus, to, to reflect who Jesus was. To the truest fashion. What happens when, when the middle of the wheel is out and things start to wobble and then all the whole thing comes loose? I finally took the winter tires off my vehicle yesterday. If we get snow from now on, it's my fault. But if you don't tighten those lugs at that hub, it is going to be a bad day for you. You're not going to get very far. And if the church doesn't hold true as the hub and as the centerpiece if it doesn't hold to the teachings and represent the testimony of Jesus, first it'll start to wobble and then it'll be completely catastrophic and the message of Christ will go nowhere. Church, that's our obligation. This is what he's saying. Walk worthily. And who, who is implicated in this? He says it's to each one of us. We know that Paul was writing, we said, to the church. He was writing to the church at Ephesus. This letter was circulated to many churches, so it was written to the body of Christ. But within the body, it was written to the members of the body. So there, there are corporate implications to us as the body of Christ, and then there are individual implications to us as members or belonging to the body of Christ. So he says it's to each one. He's over all, he's in all, and he's through all. Who's included in this? Who's implicated in this? Whose responsibility is this? Man, you guys really know because the Greek translation of that all really means all. It's all. There's no way to, to slice it a different way. It means everyone. It means all. He said he's over each one. He's in each one. He's through each one. It's the same spirit, the same father. He pulls us again into that imagery of we belong to the same family, to the same household. When he when he invokes the name of our Father, he's saying, we're together in this under one head, our Father, our shared Father. And then he continues in, in verse 7. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. And, and last week we talked about grace. We said grace is that word charis. It's this favor, it's this gifting. Jesus empowers his church with incredible gifts. He's apportioned gifts to his church. What are they? So Christ himself gave the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers 
to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. This is going on from Ephesians 4 and 11. Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The church has been given incredible gifts in, in what we understand as the fivefold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These gifts, this charis, these gifts are for the equipping of the church. These gifts are for the strengthening of the church. These gifts are for the building up of the body into fullness. And when these gifts are in operation in the church, the church will grow to maturity. And talking about those, those gifts or fivefold gifts or apostles and prophets, that makes, may make some people feel uncomfortable or maybe they think that those gifts sort of died off. But whose idea were these gifts? It's not, it, it's not a trick question. He, Paul starts off, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So it was Christ's idea that through these gifts that the church would be built up and strengthened and moved on to maturity. So then what we have to understand is that we need to receive the ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We need to sit under the anointing and under the calling of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And church, we need to be in support of recognizing and submitting to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Dr. Jeremiah says that the gifts that God provides should always be used for the edifying of other believers and to create unity, intimacy, maturity, and stability in the church. Now, now to explain all of these, we wouldn't have time to today and we wouldn't be able to do it justice. So we're going to save them for a, a series on spiritual gifts. But what we can think is that the work that God has for us to do is strictly reserved for those who are vocationally called to full-time ministry in the calling of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Because what he says is, to each one of us has been given. To each one of us has been given. Remember what you said, this is what you said, who's implicated in this? You said all. And Paul goes on to say, to each one of you has been given this gift. And so Pastor Ray Dirksen, he's, uh, if you've taken Hearing God or Grow Character or, or gone to any of those church renewal um, classes, this is what he says. He says, all saints have the ability and gifting to teach to a certain degree. Isn't that true? We have lots of teachers that go to the church, lots of people in education. They're, they're professional teachers by trade. Incredibly gifted teachers. Does that mean that everybody else is not a teacher? No. Are, are coaches of your sports teams teachers? Are people that instruct in, you know, in woodwork or trades, if you're learning in a trade, are, are they teachers? How about parents? Do you need to be a teacher? Absolutely you do. That's your responsibility. And so we have various degrees of the giftingness of teaching and, and it and it doesn't just stop at teaching but we find that maybe the most palatable to say yes everyone needs to be able to teach to some degree but all saints also have the ability or gifting to shepherd to a certain degree all saints can evangelize to a certain degree i thought i'd get a little support there and i say it again all people have the ability to evangelize to a certain degree it's not just up to the professional evangelists in the tent and camp meetings and the billy grahams to evangelize the the message of the gospel, but everybody, all saints can prophesy to a certain degree, that is testify or speak out the word of truth or the word of God. We can do that. All saints have the ability to create, initiate, and lead to a certain degree. So all are implicated. We are all being called to put into practice or use the grace, or in other words, the gift that Christ has given us. And I love this quote. It says, the Christian community is essential for growth to maturity because Christ has sovereignly endowed every individual with special abilities to minister to all other members. 
And then it's the responsibility of the divinely gifted leader to equip the members for a life of mutual service. Now, hasn't that been Paul's message from the beginning? This is what he's been telling us from the beginning of the book of Ephesians. Remember, he's saying that, that he foreknew us and he predestined us to be conformed according to his son for, for good works. That he predetermined, that he prepared in advance for us to do. What are, what are those good works that he predestined us to do in his son? It was the work of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And, and there's many more, but this is what he has determined for us in making us his handiwork in being his masterpiece, he apportioned to you a giftedness to be used within his body. That's an exciting word for you because it means that God has a, a purpose and plan for you being here. 1 Corinthians 12 and 4 says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them all. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit was given for the common good. See, that's, that's to each one. That's to everyone. That's how we could say that you have a fit that you need to find. It's how we could say that if you're here and you're alive, if you're here and you're breathing, if you're here and God woke you up this morning, it is an infinite grace and wisdom, and he determined that you should live on this day in 2024, then he has a purpose and plan for you being here today. He has a purpose and plan for your involvement, for your building up of the church together. Romans 6, or 12 and 6 says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. And I say as your pastor a resounding amen to that. Let us use them. Because what happens when these gifts are functioning and exercised in unity under Christ in his church. Paul continues in verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love as each does its part. As each one does its work. Paul and, and Jesus are concerned for your maturity. Maturity matters. And, and it's part of my role as a pastor. It's part of my fit. It's part of my Charis, the giftingness, to help you grow up. And you may not like that. It may be uncomfortable. And I told people that I was told by somebody that I don't really think of you as my pastor because you're so young. And I apologize. But God didn't send an older person to lead this church right now. I, I have some grays, and you're making them grayer in my beard, but this is the fit that God established for us here, that you would mature. And I know that with a little bit of pressure, that carbon can turn into a diamond, that can there be something beautiful come out of your life if you're willing to stay in the tension and the pressure of what Jesus is developing. And I love the simple job description of being a pastor. It's the pastor's job to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's my job. That's what I have to do. And, and it says that the reason that you have to be under this ministry and the reason that you have to submit to it as Jesus desires for you to do is that so you will no longer be babies. Some people have been in the church for decades and let's be honest, they're still... You, I didn't say you're a baby. You said it. They're still a baby. They're still immature. They're still infants. Why? Jesus doesn't want you to remain a baby. In fact, he wants you to mature. He wants you to grow up. And then he wants you to reproduce. 
That's what he desires from your life, reproduction, so that you may have fruit and fruit that will remain. And here's a biological truth that somebody can explain in greater detail. You cannot reproduce if you never mature. You cannot, you will not reproduce if you never mature. And so we see this incredible attack on the church. The church as the hub or the central place to which Christians are supposed to mature and belong. And so we see, we see an attack on that. And we see a, an attack on the office of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. We have an attack on the validity and the truth of God's word in order to dilute this message, in order to tear down the structure and, dis and just to break up what God has established to be his means by which the world comes to know his son. It was the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And we said that. We said it for weeks in a series. And so you can understand why I get a little miffed perturbed i get a little you know the hair on the back of my neck that's where there still is hair on the back of my neck why it stands up a bit when people say they are christians but they don't belong to a church and eh, they don't like the church and they don't need the church they they don't need the church they they have another church, you know, they belong to. They, they, they watch their, their preachings and their teachings. They, they have another church. That wasn't Jesus' plan for you, to not be connected to the body. I said before, a body without a head is dead. And there, there are no, like, just one pieces. There's no just finger of the body of Christ existing just somewhere. There's, there's a full body. We need a full body. And if it was God's plan for you to belong to the body of Christ in Australia, because that's where your pastor is, guess where you would have been born? If, if that was the church to which you were supposed to grow in and mature in and be planted in, then God would have planted you in that church. And that is not me speaking against those churches, because I believe in the church and the body of Christ. But if God wanted you to go to Gateway, and for Pastor Joel Olstein to be your pastor, he probably would have had you be born in Texas to a family there so that you might be sit under his teaching. But instead, he gave you me. He's firmly established and planted you here. And so rarely, and this is rarely, do I find a person who is belonging to a different church or has found their comfort or found their calling in a particular set of teachings or of a ministry? Rarely do I find that person to be somebody who is maturing, growing in the body of Christ and reproducing. Because God desired that you be firmly planted. At some point, you can incubate something in a greenhouse long enough and then you, you need to plant it. You have to be planted somewhere. And Jesus desires that you be planted. And so those people that are off on their own, they refuse to come under any other teaching of any other apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And so they lean so heavily in a direction that God hasn't established for them that they're no longer in balance. How can you walk worthily when you're out of balance? And so God desires you to be here, part of the body that is being built up and matured under his head. We have to live according to what Christ has achieved for us. How are we going to walk worthily? We have to walk according to what Christ has achieved for us. We have to live according to who Christ has made us. We're the, we're the body of Christ. We have to live according to who Christ has made us to be. We have to live according to what Christ has taught us. The full revelation of Jesus. The full word of God that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces. When the word of God hurts you, it's because it's truth. And Jesus is trying to reach you with his truth. He has to go in there and dissect all of the disease parts that are going to cause a stunting of your growth in order that you may mature healthily. And then we have to live according to how Christ has blessed us. He has blessed us with diverse gift, with 
incredible gifts, with important gifts. And so we have to live according to that. And this is the picture that becomes clear when we look inside the framework of what it means to be in Christ. If you're not in Christ, if you don't claim to be a believer, then you can disregard all of that unity and all of that sitting under the authority and all of that belonging in the body and all of that we're brothers and sisters because that is for those that are in Christ who's holding all things together. We're going to prepare to just receive communion in a moment, but I want to go back to those words of Paul in verse 2. Because in verse 2 he tells us that we need to be completely humble and gentle patient and bearing with one another in love. All of those things were first displayed in Christ. In Christ. Christ was the first one to display those things. His humility. He was, he was humble. He washed the disciples' feet. He was, he was lowly, or, or the words here, he was, he was gentle gentleness or meekness that's not weakness meekness is not weakness in fact that word is the same word they use for a stallion a wild stallion that has been come under the control of a master in other words it's strength under control this meekness strength under control suffering long in other words jesus is patient it's the opposite of having a short fuse we all know what it means to be short fused or short tempered Jesus was suffering long or long suffering and he's bearing or he's enduring in love. That's the God that we serve who's enduring in love and we see all of these things perfectly in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Paul pens the words that are so poetic in, in Philippians chapter 2, talking about Christ when he says, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Where do we have to look to find the example of how to live in Christ? It's to Jesus himself, who lived his whole life empowered by the Holy Spirit, walking in step with the calling that the Father had on his life in perfect and complete unity, fulfilling the good plan that God predestined for him to do. It was in Christ. Would you stand this morning? I'm going to ask that our board members and our pastors just prepare that we're going to have an opportunity to respond for prayer after communion. But let us not lose sight of the fact that we cannot live worthy without the cross. He says walk worthily. We can't do that apart from the cross. We can't have unity without the cross. We will never find or develop maturity away from the cross. Without the cross, we have no gifts. In fact, we have no hope without the cross and certainly no salvation without the cross. It's central to all we believe that we can grow into the body, the full stature of Jesus' body because of what he endured through his body. It was worth enough to Christ for his desire for us to be one in him that he would go to the cross for us. And so in order to walk worthily, I believe that we need to stand before God and we ought to examine ourselves as the scripture says as we hold the, the motivation for our worship and for our holiness and for our unity, we ought to examine ourselves. This week in our staff meeting, I talked a little bit to our team about the responsibility we have before God and that we're all going to give an account. Each one will stand before God and give an account of what they had did in the body. Each one, again, each one. You won't give an account for your neighbor, you won't give an account for your spouse. You won't give an account for me. I have to give an account for me. And as one who is a pastor and teacher of the word, I'm going to be held to a higher standard than you will. I will be judged more harshly to how true I was to this word, how true I was to teach you the wholeness of Christ, how 
how true I was to respond to God when he asked to preach a certain word, when he, when he asked for correction or rebuke or to train you in righteousness so that you may be built up. I will be held to that standard and I'm so aware of it each and every week that it keeps me on my knees before God to say, Lord, you have to speak through this because these are not my words, these are your words. And so we have to stand before him with the great sacrifice in our mind and say, Jesus, how am I living today? So we just wanna do that for a moment. Just close your eyes or whatever in a moment of introspection. Say, Jesus, how am I living today? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know. See if there's any wicked way in me, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus, prepare your body today. Prepare your bride today, Lord. Search us that we may be brought into full maturity in you. That our life may measure up to the incredible gift of your sacrifice. Lord, we lay ourselves on your altar today. Completely over to you once again. We say, Jesus, take my life. Thank you, Jesus. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and he said, For what I received from the Lord, I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we hold this, as Paul tells us, to walk worthily. We say, this is what it means to walk worthily. It's to give your life as a sacrifice. Let's receive this body together this morning. Paul said in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we know as Paul's talked about all through the book of Ephesians, there's a time coming when all things will be brought under complete unity under Christ. So every time we drink this, we declare that day is coming. And until that day, we live and we strive to follow Christ's example and to live up to this incredible calling to give and give. Let's receive the cup today with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Now our board of elders and our pastoral staff, they're going to come to the front. And we just want to open the altar for just a time of ministry and that's how we're going to close out the service just allowing people to be prayed for if you have a tension that you're living in if you're struggling within the tension to see how this is being worked out in Christ and you just want somebody to pray for you we want to just anoint you with oil and pray if, if you're if you're dealing with a with a sin and you want somebody to just stand with you and walk through that confession with you and pray over you, we want to do that for you as well. And if you're, if you're sick in your body and you just believe in God for a healing, we want to anoint you with oil and pray that God would just heal you and touch you, whether it's in your mind or your body or your spirit, believing that God can do the exceedingly beyond today all we can ask or imagine through His church, to His glory. Amen. And then Pastor John will dismiss us and mothers, we have a gift for you on your way out. If you'd like prayer, just come now.
this a place of prayer and if you want to stay in and keep singing and worshiping you're welcome to um, but if not you are dismissed and we just would ask that you go and visit in the foyer just to be respectful of those who are still here for prayer but god bless you have a great week and we'll see you soon